so my background is risk management, governance, I'm an accountant, all, into all of that sort of stuff. Um, and that will hopefully come through. We've um, focused on our long-term future of New Zealand um, and particularly in, interested in areas of reporting, climate change, biodiversity, et cetera. Um, Josephine is, has done the major amount of research and the detail in this um, and will speak to some of it. Uh, but particularly, we want to talk about the Bhutan example of um, biological corridors and um, that's what Josephine will speak to. So basically, I've just done the introduction. Basically, what we're going to go through is um, very briefly the eight recommendations because we know that you will have read it. I've heard you say this many times, so well done. Um, impressive. Um, I'm going to talk about three myths which are just really setting a context to the background. So we're going to just go quickly over some of the data because, of course, accountant and researcher, I can't help myself. Um, rationale for our approach, and I know this has been talked about a lot, um, look at listening to other submitters and reading their submissions, the biodiversity crisis, the climate emergency. Um, I'm going to spend a bit more time on compounded events um, because I think that that's actually a missing area and actually I'm speaking on that both tomorrow and the next day. So it's actually been um, very appropriate to um, be in that space and share this with you. And lastly, talking about strategic solution, creating the ecological corridors and this massive strategic opportunity that this provides. Um, if I said there was two words that defined my focus and the work that I'm doing is trying to get New Zealand climate ready. Um, so I don't, I don't see, I see New Zealand as one country actually in one planet and I actually see that we are in a very difficult position and we have to work together. So it is that basis upon which I want to present this idea. Um, so here we go, myths. First one, we are protecting our unique flora and fauna. Well, clearly we're not. This won't be um, anything new to you, um, but it's just terribly important as a context for what you're looking at. Um, second one, we're managing our CO2, <laughs> clearly not, um, and that's something that's um, obviously really concerning, um, I think, tank looking at New Zealand's long-term future, um, and that we have more protected areas than other countries. Well, we're actually sort of 29th on the list. Admittedly, this percentage is dependent very much on how you define it, and as a researcher, I understand that, but it is, I think, this um, opportunity we should be going out broader and wider rather than shrinking our, um, our protected areas. Um, now, solutions for the West Coast. So this is, um, I just put this together really quickly because I'm a great believer that you lead by a vision. You have to have a way of actually thinking um, and sharing an idea. And the West Coast is a terribly special part of not just um, New Zealand, the South Island, not just of New Zealand, but of the world. We've got to be sort of very big and ambitious, I hear. Um, I think that's the only way that we're going to get through and actually look after our people, both now and in the future. So what what do we what are the goals for the West Coast? Well, the first thing is um, this concept of um, sponges. And I know it sounds, if you take a little sponge, the, the, the dialogue internationally is actually around sponge cities because basically we're going to have, you know, massive floods. How do you create that? Now, the West Coast has already got a bit of sponge, which is fantastic, but actually it's about building that sponge. And, you know, with what you've gone through is um, terribly significant. The, um, you know, the nature base, the Wild West, you're already using the concept wild and your branding. So it's actually, you know, looking at ways that you can build on that. The concept of a carbon sink, gosh, you know, the whole West Coast could be a massive carbon sink. It already is, but how could we optimise it? The concept of the new UN World Heritage Area, we've only got three in New Zealand, which is pretty poor, considering our brand, and we could actually extend from, you know, right up to the west coast of New Zealand, the South Island. Um, the latest research, I just wanted to put this in, is just understanding how important we've got a mental health crisis, terrible things are happening to our young people, actually getting them, they say, an hour's walk in um, a natural environment. Actually, they have actually now been able to prove that um, it actually improves mental health. So I wanted to add 
within our PowerPoint and our notes, we actually have all the links and, and references, and we are, um, and we will get that to you in the next day or two, um, just in case you, you come up with some great questions and I want to add some more stuff. But um, just to be aware of that. So our the solution, ticking all of those boxes, is this concept of an ecological corridor. So... Um, what we've got the eight recommendations. I'm not going to go through those in any detail, but I did want to let you know that any system needs great feedback loops. And when I look at this, you know, it isn't there in any detail. And I really wanted um, for you to think about this is, you know, you're 35 years in, what's the next 35 years look like? How are you going to know that you're managing these things well? So I'm just going to flip through those quickly. You're going to need extra resourcing. You've got to actually get New Zealand to invest in the West Coast. And that, you know, that's where those biological corridors are so terribly important. You need money. So you need an idea. You need to market. So this is, this is you know, you can sort of see where I'm going. Um, this concept of constant reviews, independent reviews, so that you build trust. I mean, you know, the West Coast is just a little example of what's happening globally. Democracy is based on good information um, and, you know, people having access to it. Um, so these are really important issues. Um, now, background, like I said, I can't help myself with my numbers. So this is um, this is by the numbers, and we would, we consider this as nationally significant. Um, we're not great, I think, on the process, although I understand why it's come about. But this land was very largely 35 years ago put a bubble around it, and then it, you know, with respect, um, and you guys are part of the process and system that's trying to um, get ahead of this. But it's a very short time frame to look at something that was put in place 35 years ago to actually have this discussion at a later time. And there's a lot that's happened in 35 years. So if you said to someone, let's say Canada, and it was 2% of can, can land in Canada, you would think that that is nationally significant. And that's my point there. The numbers actually tell the story. Um, now, the 35 years is terribly important because um, if you go back to um, 1987, when this has happened, we, there was actually a population of only 3.4 million people. And now we're 5.1 plus, plus, plus. And so basically the importance of that land actually becomes more important because there's more people. So that's forgetting about, you know, the biodiversity and climate change, which I'm going to talk about. But it's actually understanding that this is a national asset that is being debated here. And one of the things that does worry me is that I don't think the rest of the country's got this. I mean, I, I haven't looked at your analysis of your submissions, but under the Resource Management Act, you do have this concept of um, national support. So I'll race, th I'll race through that. That's sort of all pretty obvious. This is obvious. You guys know all about this. Um, biodiversity crisis, I'm going to assume that you've looked at all of this because you will have done, I'm sure, but you can come back to me if you um, have anything else in those spaces. So this is actually hopefully very readable for you, understanding the level of the crisis in biodiversity. Um, a climate emergency obviously is something that um, has only just recently happened. And, um, and that, once again, we talk about the population issue in 35 years, but the fact that the whole climate landscape has changed so significantly and the whole country needs to get climate ready, um, the whole country, the world does. Um, I wanted just to point out um, the National Climate Change Risk Assessment for New Zealand, and you'll see first one, national um, environment is risk of coastal ecosystems. We're dealing with a massive coastal space in this area um, and you can go through all of those um, and you'll see the, the biggest risk there in the urgency is the risk to potable water supplies. Um, so, um, but I won't, you know, that's all very readable hopefully for you, rationale. The next bit that I wanted to go to, I'm sure you've seen a lot of these um, maps 
Um, but the one I wanted to um, talk to, and I've got three slides which are orange, and this is actually sort of new research I would classify as in terms of the way that we are thinking based on there's an IPCC um, six assessment report. Um, it has a chapter 11 that looks at climate impacts. It's a um, very um, significant, deep, horrid area to read. And um, But what I wanted to do was talk about what that what happened with that risk assessment report. Um, basically, they came to, previous to that, climate change was looked at in terms of whether it's hot or cold or wet or dry. It was the way that we looked at it. it. The best way to explain it is if you're baking a cake, we were looking at the ingredients. We weren't look, looking at the combination. We weren't looking at um, droughts that might last two or three years. We weren't looking at downpours um, that would actually you know, create massive slips one day and then completely dry out the next so that it killed the vegetation. We're not, you know, we're dealing in a very different understanding of climate change than we had, say, three to five years ago. Um, the way the IPCC put it is that on the right hand side is the new way, which is the new way to climate change. It's to understand magnitude, frequency, really. Yeah. Just, just mindful that the timer is running, running out. And, and you're providing really good coverage of matters that need to be considered by the panel in making these recommendations, um, and, and, and which is the context of what you're submitting on. Just want to make sure you have enough time to talk to the, to the matters in regards to reclassification and those biological, well, those corridors that you're talking about. Okay. The, the reality is what we're saying is that it's, yeah. I'll wait to you look at these two slides are important because this is actually showing the confidence and the quality of the data and then this is the likelihood of the impact. So in other words, you can actually go through and have a look at those. I'm going to now pass over to Josephine. Thanks, Wendy, and thank you to the panel. So just quickly, we'll go through what would be the dream really is to use this land to create ecological corridors. So you would have read in our submission, um, uh, developing an interconnected path of conservation land is the best way to protect native flora and fauna. It allows species to migrate. So that's the old um, Institute think piece about how theoretically this could look. Um, and on the next slide is the example of Bhutan, um, which is quite inspiring. They've, as a country, worked to, their constitution has a stipulation about how much um, of the country should be under forest cover. So we've used that as an example of a way you could approach um, this reclassification process, uh, especially the scale of it is so significant that there's a real opportunity here to do something exciting and interesting with New Zealand. Um, and so that's an example you can see in the map there, the corridors they've created. It's pretty much allowing species to move as well as climate change impacts their habitats. So where species are living now might not work. You saw um, Wendy's presentation about the extreme weather, etc. So giving species and the environment um, room to move and adapt as unfortunately things are going to change. Um, and next slide. Um, the scale, you, I mean, you guys know how, how huge this is. Take my hat off to the panel. Um, and I'll quickly give it back to Wendy so we don't run out of time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so if, um, if you're open to questions now, we're, we're at that time where we need to awesome. Thank you very much. And thanks again for the context, you know, and, and of what you're wanting to, what, which is the foundation of what your um, submission is based on. Really interested. So can you, um, Wendy, are you able to go back to that um, slide with uh, um, the, well, um, of, the, of New Zealand, where you were on the lower South Island, on the South Island anyway, in terms of the corridor. Yeah. 
That's great. Thank you. Yeah, because you yeah, just wanted to focus in on this in regards to the reclassification land. And, and that's what we've been noting that, yes, there's context that you've given, but want to focus in in regards to this. So, questions from the panel? Uh, I'll ask for Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I was looking for one now. Um, firstly, I'd just like to understand what, who and what is the um, McInnes Institute? I think mean, there's nothing in the submission to explain that. Yes, great, thank you. So the Institute has um, been in existence since 2000. It's a think tank that um, focuses on new things and opportunities. We focus on much young people and workshops um, with Treasury and um, the Reserve Bank and other entities, um, the Governor General. So we've um, got an aspect of our work in that area. Um, another aspect of our work is um, heavy, pretty heavy research. We do um, a lot of research into like climate change reporting and issues like that. Particularly um, with COVID, we move more to research than um, public engagement with young people. But that was obviously because we couldn't run any more workshops and, um, and bringing people from throughout the country. We focus on 18 to 25 year olds. Is it a, is it a family institute? Um, no, we have, um, Josephine is the first time she's actually been working with me for about the last, uh, three, I don't know, on and off I suppose for three years. She's actually um, got a law degree and, um, but that we have a team of about eight or ten people. Uh, we have interns that come in from the university. We focus, we're not a public think tank, so you won't see us very often in the um, press. We actually do um, I call it um, research on the edge that um, tries to provide um, information for people. Uh, I work with, for example, I've got meetings with OAG and local government NZ. You know, I, I work with um, what I would call the policy um, thinkers in the country um, rather than the press and the media. So that might explain to you why you don't know us very much. Um, just, just quickly, you um, early in, uh, uh, earlier on you um, touched on the World Heritage Area, and you suggested that World Heritage could be extended right over, right over the coast. That would leave a lot of room for that other um, and critically endangered species, Homo sapiens, would it? <laughs> no, no. Uh, basically, um, the heritage status or heritage areas are, I'm going to say, relatively flexible people um, do de or depending what kind of standards or rules put, are put on it but it's a um, you know it's a it's a bit more fluid than it possibly sounds initially so we're all right we can hang in there <laughs> <laughs> I know, I thank you for your submission okay, thank you um, morning Thank you, submission. So, just if I understand the, the concept of biological corridors correctly, you just want to. So, what you're advocating for is a system of land classifications that creates that continual pathway across the country. Yes, and we and this is the opportunity to create the first corridor. And you you basically have this opportunity right now, and I worry that you will lose it. Um, and I think it's like I think a fantastic contribution. So you're spot on. That's exactly now how the corridors would work. They normally work, work around rivers, and you would understand that it's this concept of um, the biodiversity, um, the sponge, the fact that you know climate change, the waters, the rivers will flood. So it's it's actually goes right into risk management as well. But it's this absolutely this idea that our biodiversity, our flora and fauna, um, can't move across um, other forms of land. You know, you you want to be, create a very rich ecosystem so that um, it's very productive. I suppose is the way to say it in terms of enabling. Um, um, threatened species to survive and to travel. The other thing is just geographically, you've got to remember New Zealand actually isn't a horizontal across the temperature um, of the planet, it's actually vertical, which actually enables as the heat comes on, you want to enable um, the flora and fauna to be able to move and that provides uh, It's a, we're very fortunate that we have that dynamic in our geography. Thank you very much. 
building on Anna's question, I I assume from what you've described and use of the term corridor, that these parcels of land that form the corridor actually need to be physically linked. It doesn't need to be just parcels, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. The the idea is that you do create this link so that and it and it can be walked um it's public land it can be climbed like the previous speaker it's 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 basically a, a respect to nature um is the way i would put it it, it doesn't it it should empower and embrace and strengthen our country it, sh it it follows our values and how we see and think about ourselves so for me it, it's a natural consequence it's the fact that it just, just wins ticks boxes in every area that creates the opportunity and that's and that's the strategic aspect of the land that you're looking at classifying so you and i and i do this myself in analysis you're in there in the detail and you're looking at every specific area and you've got a helicopter up sometimes and actually say what is the strategic opportunity for the country here what is the strategic opportunity for the planet you know who who are we and what future are we going to leave for new zealand in 2050 or 2100 i mean you know it's um it's it's actually understanding the dynamic this is like for me a gift this is a massive gift to New Zealand that was set up in 1987. And 35 years later, we've got an opportunity to revisit that based on all these things that happened in the last 35 years that actually, make, for me, make it much more significant and much more important population, climate change, you know, the, um, the, the, these compounded climate change events that you've already experienced, which are going to increase. So, Sorry, I'm talking too much. <laughs> I'm packed. <laughs> yeah, you are best, and I'm just mindful of managing time and um, also getting key information from you. Um, there's a question here, please. Okay, so we're, we're charged as a panel with classifying stewardship uh, lands. I'm interested in your concept, but I want to ask you, are your uh, recommendations, your expression of that corridor concept? Yes, that, that's, a, that's a really good um, question because basically the way it was set up, the pro way it's set up for you is to be very specific and look at the detail. Um, and I, I suppose that's where we sort of started. But when we, particularly with all the other work that we're doing in this space, it became much more strategic that this opportunity became available. And once it's lost, you can't claim it back. So it's this, in, in the fact of the 35 years. So yes, we started, we started like you were, but we actually became much more aware of the opportunity. And to be honest, I was in the heat wave in the UK. Climate change is phenomenally, you know, I used to think it was a long term thing. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. I do appreciate the passion. And uh, uh, to the commitment you have, have to it, I just um, needed to, to stop there. And uh, you got the main point across with regards to similar question I had. The, the, the concept you're wanting to, that they found is the foundation of your submission, um, is all of this content. But the, rec um, the recommendations per the area is how you see it working out, and you've taken a strategic approach in regards to a long-term view on that. So thank you very much. Thank you both for your time. And apologies that I was constrained in regards to it, but needing to be mindful of other submitters. But thank you both for that for your time today and the and the work put into the um, submission. Thank you very much.